Hi and welcome back for day 3 of the Himalayan Club annual seminar. I hope you've enjoyed the talks over the past couple of days. Today we begin with Peter van Geet. Peter van Geet is an ultra runner, explorer, alpinist and minimalist. In 2018, Peter ran 2000 kilometers in the remote mountains of northeast Vietnam. In the summer of 2019, he fast hiked the Indian Himalaya crossing 120 lesser known high passes spanning 3500 kilometers. That same winter, he climbed 200 forts across the Sayadris in 2 months. Today, Peter is joining us from the Himalaya as he completes a 2000 kilometer winter traverse of Uttarakhand. He will tell us more about his running journey and his minimalist travel style. Hello there, this is uh, Peter for the Himalayan Club. Um, in this presentation I'm going to talk about my mapping efforts of the Western Himalayas during the lockdown of 2020. followed by a 2000 km exploration of Uttarakhand in the winter of 2021 a small introduction my name is peters uh, i was born in belgium on the right you can see me uh, even at young age pretty minimalist on the beach in belgium the north sea on the left side uh, a photo taken in the swiss alps on one of the annual summer holidays uh, with my parents uh, which i think took made a big impact on later years in life being attracted to uh, the mountains and nature after finishing my masters um, in belgium i came over to india 22 years ago started the chennai trekking club a very active outdoor community a non-profit volunteer based platform that grew to 40000 members over uh, 10 years 2008 to 2018 organized many sports and outdoor events. Uh, I got into ultra running somewhere in 2013, so many years ago, and uh, it really uh, I was bitten by the running virus. It made me feel free to run with very minimalist luggage here on a run 500 km run from Jammu to Manali across the Rotan Pass. It was like a wonderful feeling to run in these beautiful majestic mountains. I then decided uh, 4 years ago in 2017 to quit the corporate world and start with uh, full time uh, exploration across thousands of kilometers through the mountains. So my project I named it Ultra Journeys. Ultra Journeys started with a 2000 km run through the northeast mountains of Vietnam and then in the following years in 2018, 19 and uh, just now in the winter of 2021 I completed three uh, long long journeys through the Indian Western Himalayas. You can see a picture of the beautiful Pangi Valley with the Pir Panjal in the background where I run from Shimla to Jammu over a 800 km of run. Okay, let's take a look at uh, what was happening in the lockdown after some initial uh, feeling bored and feeling locked up at home as an outdoor person. I got into mapping of the Himalayas. I had a couple of uh, friends Amon Vaibhav Jolly and Ritu who assisted me in this uh, Herculean effort actually to make a first uh, accurate and detailed mapping of the Western Himalayas all the way from Kashmir to Uttarakhand. Uh so the main efforts of the mapping basically was to uh, identify various available map sources, georeference them. and identify as many hiking routes passes glacial lakes and human settlements as possible to make it more easy for anyone in the world in the independent hiking community to explore this beautiful part of the world uh, if you look at europe there are like infinite number of uh, properly mapped uh, well marked uh, what we call way marked uh, hiking routes you can see western europe which has like umpteen thousands and thousands of kilometers of routes similar situation in the us and in nepal if you then look at the indian himalayas it's just a blank pictures except for a couple of peaks and a couple of highways villages in the plains actually uh, it's completely empty nobody has actually ever done a proper detailed mapping of the himalayas which is accessible to the worldwide hiking community 
So I started looking at what is available. And so obviously people who go to Ladakh will know about the Oli Zen maps, uh, detailed maps, one by 150K scale by a Swiss uh, gentleman who has mapped most of the Ladakh as well as part of the northern uh, Himachal. So a lot of hiking routes there, passes are marked here. You can see the Potla, the Kangla over the great Himalayan range connecting Lahol with Zanskar. <laughs> So this was one source. Another very interesting source was a secret mapping project by the Russians uh, during the Cold War on the Stalin, where they mapped the entire world in great detail, uh, up to including the Himalayas, where they marked many passes and uh, hiking routes on those days. This is like many decades ago when there was still no uh, satellite technology to even, I mean, generate these elevation maps or contour lines, all beautiful manual cartography with lots of uh, detail in a pretty accurate form, one by 100,000 scale. And then, of course, coming home, uh, started by the British as part of the great three gonometry uh, triangulation uh, mapping of India. You have the survey of India, which has an enormous, a very detailed and a very rich set of detailed maps of the Himalayas, Himachal, Kashmir, Ladakh, Jammu and Uttarakhand, which contain a lot of uh, remote hiking routes, both paths and trails. A lot of villages are mapped on these streams, uh, contour lines and everything, which are extremely useful. But until recently, when the government opened up, uh, GIS in India, at least for Indian companies, uh, was difficult to obtain. A fourth very important source of uh, information for mapping the Himalayas was the NGA, an American organization that has uh, mapped in detail like uh, some four lakhs of remote villages in the Himalayas, a lot of high altitude passes and lakes also which were all consolidated among the previous sources in this mapping effort. Uh, we started by mapping uh, human settlements. Um, so we mapped some 20,000 uh, villages, more than villages, I would say hamlets and isolated summer dwellings, very remote settlements, sometimes just a handful of houses across the Western Himalayas from Kashmir to Uttarakhand, which uh, was extremely useful knowing the villages uh, forward, uh, you can give the name of the village and the local people can really usually show you the right way forward. In addition to that, so using open street maps, I was able <coughs> to use the latest open street maps, which uh, as per my understanding, use artificial intelligence to basically scan different types of maps, uh, satellite maps and possibly thermal maps that allow them to automatically identify urban settlements, the ones you see in gray marked here. Uh, some of these are just individual homes or a couple of homes in a remote settlement, which really is very useful as a solo minimalistic explorer to uh, identify where you can find your next night shelter or food supply. So then also we used some three months with several people to digitize more than 50,000 kilometers of uh, hiking routes from these various sources, very remote, undocumented uh, routes. Uh, this is actually more than the circumference of the planet, uh, which is just 40,000. And uh, this would be enough actually to explore for uh, many decades to come. You can see that uh, from Uttarakhand on the east to Kashmir on the northwest uh, to Ladakh on the northeast, uh, we have actually covered the entire Western Himalayas by an extensive uh, map network. Many of these maps, of course, are pretty old, sometimes decades old. So before kind of exposing this informal open street maps to the world, we need to explore them to see if they're still existing, if they're still used, if they're not overtaken yet by the jungle or uh, destroyed by landslides and climate change. And then last section of this uh, mapping effort were the passes and the alpine lakes. So I identified some 2000 passes across the Western Himalayas and some 700 high altitude lakes. Uh, here you can see beautiful Brahmatal with uh, colorful uh, shades in the sky uh, when we explored it uh, this winter. So having these passes and lakes as a target allows you to kind of identify 
routes, hiking routes from valley to valley across these uh, passes and lakes. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, the first section where I use this extensive mapping to cover, explore basically and map, accurately record and map 2,000 kilometers of hiking routes across Uttarakhand in the winter, November to February 2021. When we say exploration and when we say winters, uh, it looks like this. Now closing into the dirty Karak, going to knee deep snow here. Last section of the pass. Quite intense. So you can see that exploration is all about opening the routes, identifying trails. So these are not uh, well-trodden routes, of course. Uh, these are not the touristic ones. These are the offbeat ones that uh, are, again, not accurately mapped on these old uh, survey of India maps and Soviet army maps. So it takes a little bit of trial and error. And then combining this exploration effort with winter, where you can see uh, knee-deep, sometimes hip-deep snow, makes it a very challenging adventure. So, um, we were lucky this winter that it was a pretty warm winter, so it snowed only kind of four times between November to March. And uh, we were able actually to go up till 3,900 meters be, um, uh, with snow up till the knee level. Uh, so we were able to come- Now closing into the dirty Karak. Uh, the journey was mostly done solo as usual. Most of my uh, thousand kilometer long uh, journeys, ultra journeys are done solo. Solo is of course a totally different experience uh, compared to going with an expedition or even going alpine style with a group of friends as you're completely alone, a single soul in an overwhelming vast landscape. With snow, it's, it's even like a different world. And it almost becomes a, like a bit of a meditative uh, journey where you experience a lot of inner peacefulness as you travel alone over this magnificent landscape. I covered uh, a total of 90 days, some 25 kilometers per day, so covering 2,000 kilometers here. You can see uh, on the left, we started from Dehradun. We went north up uh, till we hit the snow line, and then we basically did a west to east and best back to west uh, traverse over the entire breadth of Uttarakhand, crossing many of the major valleys here and with stunning views on the high ranges which were visible from these mid-level passes. More than the 2,000 kilometers, it was all about uh, covering many passes, eh, jumping from valley to valley across the ridge lines, which basically means a lot of climbing. So a total, we did some uh, 1,70,000 meters uh, to make you understand, this is equal, equivalent uh, of 19 times the height of Mount Everest. Uh, if you forget about moment about the absolute altitude, of course, of Everest, which is uh, quite challenging. But this shoots, shows you the enormous efforts. And here on this timeline, you can actually see the 110 spikes or the 110 passes that were covered in this 90 days. So an extremely intense effort. Uh, so one important thing is here that you have to go lightweight in order to cover so much of uh, climbing in such a small time frame. So I did speed hiking, which basically meant I did around one and a half to two passes per day. Every day covered 25 kilometers, fully packed uh, shelter food, gears on the back, uh, and almost 2,000 meters of climbing every single day uh, without any rest for 90 continuous days. This is only possible, of course, when you go lightweight. So here you can see my gear sets. Everything is very minimalist, including six and seven, which is my tent and my uh, sleeping bag. Uh, everything together was hardly five kilograms, which made it possible uh, as an ultra runner again to go extremely fast over these uh, steep terrain. I have to thank, say a word of thanks to my sponsor, Blue Bolt, uh, which is a, a good friend from Himachal, who has an Indian startup called Blue Bolt, providing me every year now for the last two years with uh, very lightweight and warm materials. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Good morning. Freezing nights at uh, 3,600 meters at the top of Chandra Shila, here just above the Temple of Tugnat. Welcome to my comfy Blue Bolt uh, solo tent and especially this one, the minus 12 quilt, 
which kept me warm in this freezing night. It was like an icy wind blowing. Uh, it's all snowy outside here. Stunning views on the Kedanat range. You can see Chok Chang Chamba over there. Good morning. I'll keep the videos a little short in the interest of time. And as I was saying, it's uh, all about self-exploration. There is no local guide from the villages. Uh, so how to do this is basically with four different layers, offline layers on the map. One is, of course, the open street maps, which have a lot of valuable details about the type of terrain, the forest, uh, glaciers, the rock uh, terrain, rock and ice, as well as more than 20,000 villages maps uh, by my team. Then we have the human settlements, which are marked there. We have contour lines, uh, which are essential to understand the steepness of the terrain, the elevation. And then, of course, all the digitized routes of 50,000 kilometers. So the exploration was done day by day. There was no fixed route at the beginning. Every day I used to, depending on the weather conditions, the snow line, which uh, went up and down uh, with fresh snow and with melting snow. Uh, every day I planned my journey one day at a time. Uh, I was minimalist in various ways, not just from a gear point of view, but also from a food point of view. Never carried much of food, no water, minimalist shelter, no cooking. Uh, as I was going very fast, minimalist, as a speed hiker, I was able to cover most of the traverses in a single day, allowing me to reach a village to village from valley to valley and actually resupply my food in between the villages. One beautiful thing uh, that has to be highlighted about Uttarakhand is that you have infinite number of these beautiful cobbled rock paths connecting uh, remote villages where no road has reached yet as of now. Uh, this is a lot of heritage. I mean, these paths must have been built with an um, Herculean manual effort. Unfortunately, many of these uh, paths are no longer used, uh, except maybe by the shepherds, which go grazing the high alpine meadows during summer. And part of my mapping effort was also to kind of conserve, to uh, create awareness and conserve these beautiful ancient traverses. Here then you can see the high ranges uh, on the red colors there is again the 2000 kilometer route which I followed mid-level from west to east uh, while following this route okay, where you go over passes of three to almost 4000 meters. You get splendid views on all the high ranges here marked of uh, Uttarakhand from the Bandar Punch uh, <coughs> in the west to Nanda Devi and Eastern Kuman ranges in the east. I have umpteen photos to show you by just picking out a couple. Here you see a beautiful pic uh, I'm from uh, somewhere above Monsiari on the Panchchuli range. Here a beautiful picture on Chokamba from Devar village near Kederkant. And here an amazing pic when I was staying with a uh, sadhu in a small temple at 2,700 meters, somewhere in the vicinity of Utrakashi there, uh, visible in the lights in the valley below. You can see the sunsets highlighted ranges of Gangu tree uh, below a rising full moon above. Stunning view. It was all, not only about the high ranges, but as a uh, ultra, Traverse speed hiker, I mostly focus on crossing as many valleys, as many rivers as possible. Uttarakhand, we know all the famous ones, Yamuna. Uh, we have the Bahirati flowing from Gangotri. We have uh, the Alakinanda, we have the Pindar. But you also have many in between valleys, which you can see a few highlighted here in blue, uh, which were covered. Um, uh, so many names to go through, basically. Here you can see the 109 traverses that I did, 109 passes with 108 uh, valleys and river crossings in between. So this was really amazing. Uh, specific to Uttarakhand is of course the overwhelming hospitality, just like in Himachal and say Kashmir, uh, you pass like three, four very remote settlements sometimes uh, for deep inside the forest belonged, below, been, I mean, be beyond the last road, you can say, where you meet uh, people, uh, humanity is still intact there, not touched by uh, modernization, by money, by cities. So in many places, people call you over for tea, for food and, and night shelter. If people see that you're pitching up your tent, uh, they will actually insist uh, 
uh, that you sleep in one of their rooms instead. So this hospitality, this amazing humanity combined with the beautiful nature on the way is really the highlight of most of my journeys in the Himalayas. Lost heritage, so both due to climate change as well as the um, migration, especially of the young people towards the cities, the easy money and the comfort of the cities. Many of the beautiful hamlets, which would have been thriving communities a decade ago, are now lying in ruins. So out of, out of these maybe uh, some 500 settlements that I passed easily, 10 to 15% are no longer uh, inhabited. Some are only inhabited during summer, but uh, some of them are permanently abandoned, unfortunately. Uh, at the same time, you can also see development happening as people move out from the hills to the cities. The government is going inside the hills with uh, a lot of road development deep inside remote village that is connecting the smallest settlements, causing a lot of uh, scores in the landscape, a lot of landslides. And as those roads come into existence, of course, the state of the paths, the paths are not longer used, which have been there for hundreds of years and uh, no longer maintained, unfortunately. So one more reason for me to map them and hopefully <clears throat> more international hikers will come and preserve these beautiful heritage pathways. Uh, winter again, it was a pretty warm winter, as I said. Um, it could go up to 3,900 meters. A big change for me from the previous years where I went mostly in summer between May and September and I uh, got a lot of company from the Gadis, from the shepherds in the high altitude meadows. While uh, this, this winter mission, actually, I was mostly all by myself in no man's land, uh, except for the footprints of the snow leopards and the bears <laughs> in those uh, remote ranges. The sun is about to set down, leaving an orange glow on the horizon. As we take a 360, from the top of Kalia Peak, 3,700 meters, surrounded by beautiful evening colors. One judge really in the background of my <coughs> tent, the Blue Gear Solo. And then again, as you go beyond the long last villages, you come to very remote settlements, a bit similar to the Gujars of Chamba Valley and Bangi Valley, where you really uh, get in touch with people living completely disconnected from modern society, no roads, no networks, no electricity, uh, living in very primitive settlements. But again, uh, the hospitality here is really... Eating the rotis on the wood fire. And nicely mixing with yummy ghee. Probably homemade ghee. Yummy. Wonderful <laughs> dinner after a 2500 meter elevation gain and 30 km across three passes in a single day. <laughs> Yummy. Okay. So one uh, very interesting observation I made on my journey across almost 500 villages is that uh, a lot of the labor is actually performed by the women while the many of the guys are chilling out. Uh, you see a couple of women. Uh, Sagula preparation here for the festivities in the evening. Looks like a marriage. <laughs> Everywhere you can see women carrying uh, big loaves on their back, uh, fetching uh, gra dry grasses, leaves and woods from the forest for uh, basically the cattle to feed the cattle in the villages. So again, I mean, statistically speaking, 90, 5% of the labor <laughs> seems to be happening by the women. The homes are beautiful in uh, Uttarakhand. The more remote you go, especially disconnected from the roads, the concrete and stones would not have reached and homes are constructed completely with natural materials. Beautiful big limestone roofs, wooden or rock homes uh, at the base, and then typically two floors. At the ground floor, we have the animals staying. 
uh, which will generate heat for then the people who stay on the first floor. Some of the more richer homes have beautiful uh, wood carvings at the doors and windows, as you can see. And then, of course, yeah, many of the villages is all about farming. They're quite self-sustained in terms of foods and even clothing. Some of them have hand looms. Micro farming on the small, steep terrace. As the villages are remote, farmlands here, it's impossible for not possible for tractors to come in. <laughs> so and hand labor. The farming is still done. And force of the animals. All the step farms are very steep. I can only reach the traditional farms works best. couple of pictures on cultures, a couple of videos on culture here. Here you see the traditional wool spinning, sheep wool spinning in a pretty remote village. The art of sheep wool weaving. And here you can see the one year anniversary uh, where the whole year, I mean, the whole village comes together to remember the departed souls in the one last year and some of the ladies uh, performing dancing rituals to connect with the afterlife. <laughs> Wildlife, uh, much less wildlife, uh, I mean, at least visible to the human uh, compared to South India. But then again, when it snows and when you get this uh, white blanket, then you can see really how many food imprints you come across along the way. You can also see on the right in one place, very remote somewhere near Gutu and Buddha Kedar, I came across the recently uh, deceased corpse of a beautiful snow leopard, a huge animal, very beautiful animal. Uh, even though I saw he was dead with the ice removed, was still pretty scary to approach this big hunter. You can see a small video of the animal. On the way from Pinswari to Genwali, going through some dense jungle here and finding the relatively fresh corpse of uh, I guess a leopard, pretty big pussycat, big tail there. Some damage on the skin here, not sure on the cause of that. Huge paws, not as big as mine though. Beautiful species. Eyes have been removed already. On the way from. Voila. And basically, after completing this mission, I actually during the mission itself, I was recording with my same navigation device, my phone, accurately the routes uh, explored. So, in many cases, these were not perfectly matching the ones I found on the old survey maps or Soviet maps. So, I had to accurately record them. And then my team at home was instantly uploading day by day the recorded routes, uh, once verified it, that they're still existing, that they were not washed away by landslide or overgrown by jungles. Posted them on uh, open street maps here, where uh, anyone now can uh, see them, uh, anyone in the worldwide community, you can download uh, GPX files, you can see the elevation profiles for every uh, route also, there was a detailed block written so that people can easily uh, follow my footsteps at the same time, a lot of documentation was done in both visual photos, uh, blogging, as well as uh, videos here to Instagram to inspire more people to discover this beautiful part of the Himalayas. Uttarakhand is really amazing. 
given the fact that there are so many remote settlements, which actually make it easy in terms of night stay and shelter and food that you don't have to carry everything with you, like say in Ladakh. Uh, any questions from the audience, I'll be happy to address. Also take a look at my blog, ultrajourneys.org, which as you can see in the index here, has lots of lots of information, videos, short films, training materials, and daily blogs over the last uh, three years of exploration of the Himalayas and other ultra journeys across the planet. Thanks again to the Himalayan Club for giving me the opportunity to present my uh, 2020-21 winter mission to Uttarakhand. Don't uh, hesitate to contact me uh, through my blog. All my contact details are listed there for any questions or suggest suggestions if you're interested to explore anywhere in the Western Indian Himalayas. Thanks. Rupin Dang was an early birder. He spent decades trying to rediscover the Himalayan mountain quail before deciding to instead work towards saving the bird's last known habitat in the hopes of finding it someday. Over the past four decades, Rupin has been documenting the flora, fauna and avifauna across Himalayan regions. This wealth of information is now shared with the world through the Wild Films India platform. Today, Rupin will share with us a series of short films and vignettes from across the Himalaya and share his concerns and ideas about protecting the Himalayan environment and ecology. multitude of environmental issues, concerns, factors that uh, are of prime importance when uh, looking at the Himalayan uh, ecosystem. Now the more obvious ones of course, uh, which one uh, relates to are floods. minor subsets uh, of other environmental concerns which we need to really look at from a short term and long term perspective because there seems to be very little Himalayan environmental planning in our country. Individual project level uh, environmental impact assessments do take place but how effective the, those are, how in depth those are and how forward looking those are, are all very questionable. environmental uh, devastating impact that most comes to mind to people of course is that relating to flooding because it is, causes the most devastation the most number of deaths injuries damage loss in a very short period of time now floods are something that are not new to the Himalaya indeed we had the Kohonatal uh, flood and the glacial burst that took place maybe a hundred years back in the region of Kwari Pass and the Rukkun area in that uh, wider Nanda Devi uh, basin area.
other lakes that have burst, we've had rivers that have flooded, but nothing was perhaps as devastating, shocking and uh, damaging in terms of deaths as the Uttarakhand floods that took place close to a decade ago now. Uh, the numbers that were officially touted were something like 10 to 15 to 20,000 deaths, but the actual number may have been close to 100,000 deaths because bodies were found till years after and many people were on the missing list who never made it to the list of dead because their bodies were never found. So that flood uh, and flooding incident was the most shocking. And the reasons for those floods were basically entirely relating to human development having taken place around our river systems. Now, when you go back to uh, the Uttarakhand region and the kind of developments we've had there over the last 100 to 100 years, the British were the ones who really uh, pushed new hill station towns in Uttarakhand. We've always had villages and uh, small townships and uh, uh, temple destinations. The Chartham have been there for eons. But the British created the new hill station towns of Nainital, Shimla, Masuri, and multiple other hill station towns. Now, when you look at these hill stations, they were all traditionally located on ridges. They were all located on prime high altitude ridges, which looked over to the Himalaya, looked over to the plains, and had prominent uh, uh, locations with enough uh, flat land for constructions to take place, for military bases, for sanatoria, and uh, lots of sunlight. So when you moved up to the mountains, you wanted lots of sunlight because the weather was already cool. And so all these hill station towns were developed over the last 100 to 100 years. Now what we as an independent India have done since independence has been to push the agenda of religious tourism and access to the higher reaches of the Himalaya, which are typically uh, required not for mountaineers and explorers, they were never a priority, but for or trekkers or tourists and travelers, but for religious and pilgrimage, religious tourism and pilgrimage. So access to Gangotri, Yamnotri, Badrinath, Kedarnath in Garhwal or Amarnath in Kashmir or Mani Mahesh in uh, Himachal, or these destinations was of prime importance to the local uh, gov uh, governments, state governments, national governments. And what we found is that the recent Chardham interlinking uh, roads that have been uh, planned and which are being actively developed are heavily impinging on high altitude critical wildlife, tree, plant, shrub, bird, insect habitats of the Himalaya. And the kind of road building that we are seeing happening today is absolutely devastating because roads are being built with enormous JCBs, bulldozers, uh, trucks which weigh 5 to 10 tons with uh, when fully laden and these trucks are being uh, run on mountain roads that are very nascent, newly created. All the malba, the waste, uh, well, the rock, the mud, the soil, everything being generated from that road building is being taken away for creation of pushtas, uh, embankments and rock walls. But a lot of it is going down because when a bulldozer works on a new road, all that malba is being thrown down the hillside. Now that malba acts like multiple missiles weighing from 5 kilograms to maybe 5 tons each. just goes shooting down the valley for hundreds of meters 
causing complete destruction to the forest uh, around to the undergrowth the understory and you know in the process killing birds birds eggs nests uh, animal habitats because all this takes place in the summer months when birds are breeding and so it's completely causing devastation it's ruining water channels polluting them with the uh, soil and uh, debris it's ruining bird habitats and nesting at a time when it's taking place at its peak and these roads are uh, being built at an un in a completely unplanned fashion with very very little long term planning so when an incident takes place like the one that just took place last month in february in uttarakhand in a very localized area albeit um, as a result of this glacial lake having burst or some other similar incident which i think everybody is not even sure about when this happens suddenly these things come into the spotlight and we all have a knee jerk reaction and say oh what's the cause global warming climate change let's blame all the big guys let's blame all the big factors but the fact is we are not doing any rational reasonable amount of planning at the local level at the regional level project level leave alone at the national level or the himalayan ecosystem and mountain range level there really needs to be a lot more planning between pakistan india nepal bhutan but we are not doing that uh, there are bodies that are supposed to be coordinating such uh, developmental works and activities across the himalayas but that is obviously not happening and what happens as a result is that the knee jerk reaction actually causes more damage than good but the damage that's actually taking place continues because roads are still being built at an alarming pace the damage and downstream uh, fallout from those road construction projects is continuing and what the government generally wants whether it's one government or another is to give people access is to allow pilgrimage and religious tourism to continue because that's where the large numbers are and everyone loves large numbers so uh, everyone wants to give people access gangotri is already motorable kedarnath is virtually motorable and uh, badrinath is motorable yamnotri is the last one standing but believe me very soon even that will be turned motorable and so it works for the development agenda of the state and the center to have all these pilgrimage locations to be made motorable now motorable at what cost no one's making that call the judgment call no one is planning out the long term uh, ramifications of such rampant road construction work so road construction seems to be the number one uh, reason for flooding and environmental impact in the uttarakhand himalaya at least and definitely across the rest of the himalaya as well So 
Um, when the British built the hill stations, it was well planned and on hill ridges, and I'm not praising them for that. I'm making a mere observation. When we post independence started doing our construction work in the Himalaya, it was mostly along the river valleys. So our roads were made maybe 10 feet, maybe 15 feet above the river uh, flow. Instead of looking at the 100 year uh, flood patterns, instead of looking at the long term uh, flow of the river and the high flow and the low flow and the fluvial geomorphology of the rivers, we have just left 10 15 feet and started constructing. Now, where you have a road, you will have temples, you will have shops, you will have dhabas, you will have uh, local uh, support for all of those, so homes and commercial establishments, and everything starts burgeoning along those roads in the mountains, and it's natural. So when we've not planned out the high flow of those rivers and we built our roads 10 to 15 feet above those roads, these incidents are going to happen because development follows those roads and when you've not planned out your roads, all the development is going to see a 10 year, 15 year hit from glacial debris flow, from rockfall, from various other forms of environmental impact and uh, uh, effects that are going to continuously take place in the Himalayas. So our roads have been badly planned, we continue to make poorly planned roads and that uh, development agenda continues and there's absolutely no going back on that. So when we want to blame global warming and climate change, we really should be looking at our local situation on a project basis and see where that's going. Now we all blame dams and yes, dams in the high Himalaya are damming. They can cause enormous amounts of Damage. We've seen how the Jaoli Guard has been damaged by a flood that's just come up there, the Maneri Bhali Dam. There's a lot of uh, Malba and rockfall that's happening there because the uh, entire river valleys are being shaken up by uh, movement of JCBs and tractors and uh, trucks and bulldozers. And even apart from that, uh, the Tehri Dam, much maligned, actually played a role in mitigating the effect of the Uttarakhand floods of 2013. Because when that huge flow of water came down, the Terry Dam actually absorbed a major part of that heavy flow in the summer months when the flow of the Ganga was at a low ebb and prevented further downstream damage from happening at Rishikesh and Hagwar. Now I'm not saying the Terry Dam is good or bad, I'm making mere observations here. In that particular instance, the Terry Dam served a positive uh, purpose. But dams really, really need to be figured out. I think what we need to have are pico hydels and micro hydels at the village level, at the local authority level, where villagers can actually take care of those small projects and get 10, 20, 50, 100 kilowatts of power instead of us trying to chase megawatts of power at the cost of enormous dam projects that will eventually silt over and that will eventually get to be useless over a period of time. Now that said, sand mining is illegal and we have an excess of uh, sand in the Terry Dam. So maybe there can be a way of uh, giving licenses to dredge the excess sand in Terry Dam to reduce the, uh, the, the sand uh, content that is reducing the effect of, effectiveness of the dam and turn it into a useful project where we can actually have dams
So we have to look at everything without getting emotional about it. Look at the environmental impact, the scientific rationale behind every project, and the good and bad, the positive and the negative, and weigh all that in balance. Similarly for river interlinking. Now I'm not going to go into river interlinking because that's not directly associated with the Himalayas. But we are jumping headlong into environmental projects that may or may not have uh, sufficient gain for the country and which may have questionable uh, environmental uh, benefit for the rest of the country. So we really need to look at all these factors before uh, blaming a much larger uh, series of factors such as climate change which of course has a role but may not be the entire uh, reason uh, for these localized incidents from taking place. Of course, earthquakes is yet another uh, environmental aspect which is unavoidable and which we have not taken into account. Because when that big tembler does take place in the Himalayas, the unplanned uh, and incalculable loss and damage, the kind that happened in Kathmandu some years back, with the kind of development that we are allowing to take place uh, in hill stations like Masuri and Shimla. I recently saw a parking uh, project in Masuri, which was the most enormous parking project I've seen anywhere in the mountains. Enormous girders uh, spreading across three stories on a hillside. Uh, the whole uh, building must weigh thousands of tons. The kind of impact that's gonna have on the ground and if an earthquake does take place, I don't even want to get there. Uh, about the kind of damage that could happen if uh, a massive earthquake occurs in the Himalayas. So we really, really need to do our long-term environmental planning from the perspective of rock falls, glacial slides, floods and earthquakes. The Himalayas is a, an ecologically, geologically, geographically vulnerable zone and it is subject to change. Remember the Himalayas is still growing at a couple of inches a year. So it is a young mountain range as opposed to the Shivaliks which are an older mountain range. So we really need to look at the long-term picture whenever we embark on any projects in the Himalayas and not just blame uh, uh, the larger big picture but look at what really good is going to come out from each of these projects and weigh and balance that as opposed to the political gain that may come out from certain such projects and initiatives. So in balance, uh, the Himalayas is ecologically fragile, yes. Species level, there's enormous ecological fragility. Uh, there are species that are possibly going extinct. The mountain quail has not been seen since 1873, for example. That may or may not be due to environmental reasons and may be a species level ecological loss that we've experienced. But there are species that are going up and down in number 
and we need to monitor those and I don't think there is any Himalayan ecological monitoring agency. The pheasants are a highly vulnerable group of uh, uh, bird species that we need to be looking at. Ungulates such as the Paral, Thar, uh, Goral, Serao, these are all groupings and species we need to look at very carefully because their habitats are being fragmented. Uh, tourism, uh, religious tourism, religious infrastructure development and all these other factors are things we need to really be strongly concerned about. I mean making this enormous paved cemented uh, boulevard in front of the Kedarnath temple is possibly asking for trouble because when the next big outburst comes from whether it's Chorabari Tal or a glacial flow or whatever all that cement is going to act like missiles lower down the valley and destroy the forest below there. But why look at one local area? We need to make a Himalayan agenda for environment and we need to share this with Bhutan, Nepal, Pakistan and India and talk on one platform and discuss all these various factors from ecological species level to environmental and uh, geological and put all this together because the next big earthquake will come, the next big flood will come. These are things that are cyclical, they come and go and we are going to have these issues over the years. And the last one I want to really bring up here is groundwater. The Himalaya is one of our North India's major sources of good, clean, drinking, potable groundwater and for agricultural purposes as well. So when all those streams empty out into the Dehradun area or the Kobet Terai side uh, or anywhere else in the lower foothills, uh, Siliguri and Bagdogra side on the, uh, uh, in the West Bengal or in Arunachal near Pasi Ghat or uh, in the Palampur hills of Himachal, all these areas are the catchments and the areas where the, the water is going entering into the groundwater and then comes up below and is used by all our residential and commercial developments as far away as Delhi. Now even in Delhi when you look at the flood plain of the Yamuna, we have abused it. We have built the Commonwealth Games uh, village there. We've gone and built the Akshar Dham temple on the uh, historical high flow flood plain of the Yamuna river. Now you cannot control the flood plain of the river. So when there is a big flood, all these areas will see major effects. We've already seen hundreds of buses at the ISBT terminal uh, underwater when we've had flooding and that was not even a major incident. So when the next major incident comes, we will abuse climate change, we will blame global warming and lay it to rest right there. But the fact is we have misused the floodplains of our rivers and we continue to turn our rivers into open sewage drains for all our residential and commercial sewage to be dumped into because we do not have enough STPs to treat that sewage and uh, we are going to run short of water. India is going to see a major, major groundwater uh, reduction and fresh water availability crisis in the next few years. And it is the Himalaya that is going to recharge those groundwater basins, aquifers and streams for us. So the more we do uh, judicious and adequate planning of the Himalaya, the more we will all as a subcontinent in India benefit from that. And we really, really need to look at creating a ministry for the Himalaya in the government and uh, fill it with scientists and environmental brains 
as opposed to bureaucrats. And we need to do some long term planning for India so that we can all enjoy the Himalayas as adventurers, mountaineers, birders, uh, entomologists, zoologists, or plain religious pilgrims. We all need to respect the Himalayas and appreciate it for what it is the finest geographical. The Himalaya, many things to many people. Mount Everest to some, pilgrimage to others. The Yeti or the abominable snowman to many. Bhutan and Nepal to yet others. Few outside India associate the high peaks of the Himalaya with India. And yet, more Himalayan geography falls within India than outside it. From Kashmir to Arunachal, the entire sweep of the Himalayan mountains hold a fascinating range of floral and faunal types that change with altitude, aspect and latitude. The ibex and the blue sheep or bharal are the prime high altitude ungulates of the high Himalayas. But there is one Himalayan animal that has so confounded wildlife programming and television companies around the world for many decades now. Top-notch wildlife camera persons have been consistently tasked with going out and filming this animal in the wild, more so to try and obtain a sequence of it hunting and making a kill. All have so far returned empty-handed. While some camera trap footage has come in and lots of distant footage of the big cat on the prowl or even some high-speed chases across craggy cliff faces, no one has managed to film the animal in successful hunting action. The big natural history producers and factual television channels started from the 1970s and right through till the present time. Tens of millions of dollars were spent. Crews were in the field for years. The best cameras and lenses put to work, but no footage came in. All this changed in March 2018. Wilderness Films India 
a factual production house based in Delhi, succeeded where all else had failed. We not only obtained the first ever sequence of a snow leopard successfully making a kill in the wild, but we also obtained the most spectacular hunt footage ever recorded in the history of wildlife filmmaking. Watch this video to see just what set apart our efforts from the rest of the global wildlife filmmaking pack. A two-year-old female snow leopard is on the prowl at around 14,000 feet altitude in the high mountains of Himachal Pradesh. She comes across a herd of ibex on a rocky mountain face interspersed with deep snowpack. After positioning herself higher than the ibex herd, she gets ready for the chase, even as they suspiciously eye her moves, preparing for their escape, but also sort of transfixed at the impending danger and unable to make a move. Once she starts her high-speed gallop, they take off and what follows is a treacherous chase across rocky boulders and snow on a relatively steep rocky face. The hunt peters out, however, and the ibex gain distance from the snow leopard as they are the dominant species on the rocky cliff face. She realizes it is hopeless and gives up. After catching her breath, she narrows down her interest on a pair of Himalayan blue sheep or bharal that are grazing on dried winter grasses atop a cliffy landscape after separating them from the herd. A calculated chase follows. She is lapping at the heels of the bharal male. She takes one leap and catches hold of the blue sheep. But soon, hard ground gives way beneath both of them. Whether she has calculated the distance to the edge of the cliff, or this development takes her by surprise, they are both off the cliff's edge now and spiral downwards together. The paral is in the tight hold of the female ounce or snow leopard. When the two do fall together, the snow leopard cleverly cushions her own fall over that of the blue sheep. And in that moment of extreme gravity-fueled impact, the bharal gets a chance to break away and escape. But the hungry and desperate snow leopardess has not gone through this extreme fall for nothing. She lunges forward and grabs the bharal back in the grasp of her paws and mouth. They fall together several hundred more feet, bumping and thumping their way down over the rocks, taking on huge impact and lacerations. The snow leopard twists and turns her body in the air, anticipating the rude fall at the end of the approximately 400 foot fall off the cliff. Finally, the flight and fall end and the triumphant snow leopard has a subdued bharal within its grasp. She is injured and bruised, but nothing that a few days of rest will not take care of. She proceeds to enjoy the fruit of her labor and hides away in an adjacent cliff face for shelter. of the next few days, she uses natural ice packs to nurse her bruised haunches and leg muscles. She sits in the snowpack in the hot midday sun. 
She also nourishes herself with the fresh blue sheep meat. of the week she repairs herself completely and is back in action on a full belly. Not exactly another life in the day of a snow leopard but this young female snow leopard demonstrates to us the extreme conditions that occasionally challenge its very harsh life in the high mountains. Yet this fascinating animal continues its unique way of life in the high Himalaya, far from the prying gaze of human beings. The following season, in the winter of 2019, we return to her cliffy rock faces and found her faring well and back in hunting action. We distantly followed her to check on her condition and she has no lasting effect of that fall and is dexterous and adept as ever. Hopefully she will have cubs this year. The snow leopard has a wide habitat range indeed despite low numbers throughout. From Mongolia in the north to its southern range in the Himalaya, where it is found from the Chitral and Kashmir regions all the way into the eastern Himalaya in Arunachal Pradesh in India. The snow leopard leads a solitary life in harsh and unforgiving conditions. master of its habitat and the supreme predator of its altitudinal range. One in ten hunts or even less is a success and much energy is spent on each such attempt. Yet a snow leopard must keep trying in order to feed itself and its cubs. Even the adept can falter, as with this snow leopard that literally fell off a cliff while walking across it. As one moves further west and north from Himachal to the high altitude Trans Himalaya Ladakh region, one finds communities involved in protecting the snow leopard, an elusive but strikingly beautiful species. This mysterious cat inhabits alpine and subalpine areas at an altitude of 3,000 to 4,500 meters. The snow leopard ideally preys upon bharal and ibex, which live in the same altitudinal range, but will also take a shot at a marmot or a pika or something similarly small. At the same time, it is not averse to bringing down a much larger and heavier yak, zoo or similar bovine, sometimes taking on the wrath of local villagers when it does so. But despite living close to human habitations, there is hardly any disturbance to snow leopards from local villagers and the snow leopard itself has never been known to attack or even threaten a human being. 
resource crunch on the snow-clad mountains leads the leopard to hunt villagers' livestock, resulting in man-animal conflict. This rare big cat that lives in these high altitudes has risen in number thanks to the effort of the local villagers and the influx of high-value, off-peak tourism revenues in the difficult winter months. Thanks to better stewardship of the habitat, and an increased ungulate prey base. So long as the snow leopard remains, the mystery of wild places in the Himalaya will remain and the lure of the wild will be intact. Indeed, as Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote, what would the world be once bereft? Of wet and wildness, let them be left. Oh, let them be left wildness and wet. Long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. Professor Shekhar Pathak has been teaching in Kumau University for three decades. He has researched social movements, the history of exploration, Himalayan history and languages, and has written Pandit Nayan Singh's definitive biography. Professor Pathak is associated with Pahar and edits its journal. He has been traveling in the Himalaya for over 40 years and has completed the five Ascot Arakot Abhiyan. Today, Professor Pathak will talk to us about the subject closest to his heart, protecting the Himalaya. He will contextualize the recent disaster in Uttarakhand, where he has been actively involved in rescue and rehabilitation. Haris Kapadia ji and uh, other friends, I am very sorry, we, are, we, we can't control uh, technology. Uh, due to this uh, Chamoli incident in the Rishi Ganga River, which, uh, which is the only river which comes out uh, uh, from the Nanda Devi Sanctuary, the gay, great geographical uh, creation uh, of nature in Himalaya. Uh, due to that, uh, I was uh, told that ki, uh, I, I must speak something on the Himalaya. Uh, you mountaineers and many friends of the Himalayas, you all know about Himalaya, about its length, its width, and its age, uh, which is around uh, around five to six million year old. You all know that uh, around eight countries are here in the Himalayas, Afghanistan, to Bangladesh, in between Bhutan, Tibet, India, and you all know 11, 12 states of India, Indian Himalaya, Kashmir, Himachal, then uh, other states like Uttarakhand, uh, then Sikkim, then northeastern states. Around 7 uh, crore people live in Himalayas and more than 50 crore people are dependent on the resources which are coming from Himalaya. Without Himalaya, we can't think about 
the Indo-Gangetic Brahmaputra plains, where not only civilizations but also the large economies evolved uh, during the last three, four millennium. Uh, today I will be talking on two, three aspects of the Himalaya. Number one, uh, it is uh, one of the mountains uh, of the world uh, which is unique in many respects. The very first thing is, it is the world's youngest and most fragile mountain, very young. It is the regulator of Indian monsoon and it also stops the northern cold winds which are coming from Tibet and Central Asia. Many people call it wall, but it is more than that. It is not in that sense wall because it was always open for the flora and fauna and humans. Uh, many, many branches of the Homo sapiens crossed over this uh, Himalaya and people came from different parts of Asia and Eurasia and uh, Middle East to uh, Himalaya and through Himalaya to Indian subcontinent. Then ecologically, it is very, very fragile, very, very much sensitive. And uh, bioculturally very rich. Many people think only about uh, biodiversity, but I'm adding the socio-cultural diversity of the Himalayas. And due to the social cultural diversity, we have so many languages, so many dialects, folklore, deities, patterns of clothing and ornaments and so, so on and so forth. Uh, that is the part of the Himalaya. This much of diversity is not visible in Alps or Andes and Rockies and other mountain systems of the world. As I have told that it is very sensitive. It is related with its birth because then when the large Indian mass started drifting from Africa and uh, came here and uh, started uh, hitting Asian plate, at that time, the Tethi Sea just withered away and at its place, Himalaya emerged. This story you all know uh, uh, very much and in very much detail. Now, the other aspect, very interesting aspect is the resources of the Himalaya. We all know that we have non-renewable resources and then renewable resources. Among the non-renewable resources, we have rocks, we have minerals, we have metals, we have hydrocarbons in the Himalaya. And uh, among the renewable resources, we have land, we have water, we have forests, we have wilderness, we have cattle and the humans. And uh, we have been talking, discussing land and water and uh, forest, jan jungle, jameen, and humans also, and cattle also. But we very rarely discuss and talk about the wilderness. Wilderness is the very unique creation of the Himalayas and other mountains also, seas also, deserts also. Every natural expression has its own wilderness. But Himalayan wilderness is unique because it is the combination of all resources, visible, even invisible of the Himalayas, which makes its wilderness. The Himalayan beauty, the tranquility, which, which cannot be created by humans, by us, by our system or planning commission or our World Bank or UN or any other agency. So this very natural creation, the Himalayan beauty, the Himalayan wilderness is to be looked in the context of the 21st, 22nd century. Because this wilderness is connected with different religions, different ways of living and especially with the highest forms of the spiritualism. For that, uh, we, have to, we have to preserve Himalayas to understand its dynamics and to, uh, to use it, but not to abuse it. So this, uh, this aspect, I want to, uh, to, to, to speak on more this aspect. Then after the resources, when you come to land, Actually, soil is the very basis of all civilizations. And different social ecological movements actually are trying to save their soil. Because if you save your soil, you save your civilizations. 
your culture only on the soil you create civilizations and cultures and in himalaya even chipko movement the very essence of chipko movement is to save your soil if you save your soil you save your life and lives and cultures and civilizations related with humans and all that so after the land and the soil the water is the very second very fundamental uh, contribution of the himalayas it is third pole and the world report on the mountains has said that this is the uh, this this is the water tower of asia for 21st 22nd century or coming 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 century so we have three river systems from the himalaya the indus system which is around 9.8% of the national area and it is the, the water volume is around 4.28 the second is largest ganga system very dominating system at the very heart of india it covers around 26% of the national area and 25% of the water budget of india and the third is uh, indus brahmaputra which covers around 33% of the water budget of india if you look at the total contribution of uh, these three river basins they cover 43.8% of the total area of indian nation and uh, 63% of the total volume of the water of the india lies in the basin so of these three rivers this is the greatest contribution of himalaya actually the glaciers feed uh, the rivers number one the monsoon plays its very crucial role the third thing very uh, very important i call the forests of himalaya as the green glaciers these Uh, glacier these green glaciers these forests also contribute to maintain the flow of the water in non glacial rivers of the himalaya which finally joins the major glacial uh, rivers of the himalaya the very interesting other thing is related that the ground water of whole indo gangetic plain is also connected with the himalayan rivers the fertility of indo gangetic plain uh, is connected with the himalaya historically and the floods sometime make comedy and uh, most times make tragedy in the uh, in northern india that is due to the encroachment into the catchment areas by us in the himalaya these are the three resources the wilderness comes uh, uh, after that so when we talk about wilderness we talk about two things the biodiversity first with these three uh resources which i have already talked in, in very briefly including forest the himalaya is only 0.3% of the planet himalaya covers only 0.3% of the planet but it represents 10% of the biodiversity of the globe this is this is a, a great a great uh, uh, truth which uh, we must realize we must understand a geography which covers only 0.3% less than half half percent of the planet earth represents 10% of the biodiversity of the globe this is this is really great and uh, uh, not only we us mountaineers and lover, mountain lovers but also the whole human race should respect this not only himalaya but other mountains too i am not going into the details of the biodiversity the mammals the fauna the flora the very rarest flowers of the himalayas i am skipping uh, them you you we must also know that uh, in indian himalayas we have 131 protected areas they cover around 10% uh, of the country geographical area uh, equal to the uh, uh, western ghats so there is much importance of very much importance of biodiversity in the himalayas and the cultural diversity now we comes to the last part that is the himalayan disasters as i have already told that himalaya is a very complex geology and a very difficult geography earthquakes are very prone to this area ris you may know about ris reservoir induced seismicity that is also very much at its place landslides are there uh, avalanches are there damming of the rivers is, are there and the floods are there glacial lake bursts are becoming very common in the himalayas so the avalanches and the melting of uh, the glaciers 
and uh, forest fires the loss of flora and fauna that is also there so these problems uh, multiply the himalayan uh, complexities and in the times of climatic changes when climate change is becoming very decisive globally uh, at uh, at that uh, this uh, very critical juncture uh, it will have more impact on the himalayas and the mountains uh, especially in the uh, himalayan mountains the impact of climate change will be much more than so now what are the problems today the abuse of the resources number one number two we have failed in developing the grassroots democracy we still miss good governance we still uh, we are not uh, corruption free and we we are the current tragedy happened in the rishi ganga valley you all know that rishi ganga comes out uh, from the nanda devi sanctuary nanda devi is a unique mountain geologically and geographically in whole himalaya not only in whole himalaya but if you go to other mountain systems of the world nowhere you will found a formation like nanda devi the twin mountains which are around 25 plus 1000 feet above sea level 7817 meter above sea level the main peak you may be remembering roger doplan whose body is still lying somewhere in, inside the uh, glacier around these twin peaks we have more than 14 peaks uh, or more than that uh, peaks uh, on all sides of of himalaya all sides of nanda devi and from the northern and southern sanctuary uh, this rishi ganga emerged so when this river rishi ganga comes out at the very beginning near rani village we built a hydro project it is not dam it is actually uh, a diversion a diversion dam you can say it barrage it is termed as barrage and after around 6 kilometers we have another barrage uh, known as uh, known as tapovan vishnu gal pariyojana it is just uh, around 15 km from joshi mat and uh, may, many more uh, dams were proposed there so we have more than uh, 60 or more than that i don't know the latest statistics of the dams under construction and many are uh, already functioning uh, including uh, uh, bikteri dam so these all these dams are innovations of uh, high uh, you know engineering and all that but one thing which should be understood that the dams stop the natural flowing of a river a river just dies when you make dams so what we can do what we should do is a minimum environmental flow in the rivers if we can do 50% of the water volume of the river flowing into the river and uh, the rest of the water can be used for hydroelectricity so that can create hyd- hydroelectricity and that can also save the rivers you know river is not just water river is silt also river is energy also electricity and the river also uh, the fourth part of river is the river in life so we have to look at all aspects we need electricity from the rivers but we also need other things which are going to plains like silt and soil we also need uh, the safety of the river in life and find uh, the, the the very first thing the water which which is not only being used for hydroelectricity but also irrigational purposes potable purposes and many other sacred purposes related with different religions of the region of the subcontinent the other thing which is related with this tragedy is the very unscientific way of constructing constructing roads you know 100 years back in 1890 rails reached to himalayan foothills rails reached first to india to bombay in 1853 within 40 years we have rails at our foothills this was great work done by the british but it was not just for common purposes people's purposes it was also meant for commercial exploitation it was also meant for indo tibet trade and uh, they have also their eye on the tibet and the trans himalayan regions and from foothills we were not able to take roads to into the mountains for many years 
after our conflict with china in 62 only roads being started after that there are ideas of green roads minimum loss to the soil to the rocks of the himalaya cut and fill this was the theory evolved by our own scientists in the himalaya and uh, roads are being built and you know for most of the hydel projects we have already built very good projects good roads very wide roads uh, those people who have traveled in the himalayas they can see these roads especially in uttarakhand now in the name of char dham in the name of all weather roads a uh, 1200 uh, uh, 1200 crores of rupees were uh, sanctioned for them and you know all norms all lands of the uh, uh, environmental laws of the land will not uh, used for that because if you are building a 100 km road you need eia that is environmental impact assessment for that what they did the ministry did they made 50 km uh, projects and sanctioned all and started devastating himalaya they are making 10 to 12 meter wide roads in the himalayas any person who uses his brain or minimum wisdom he can think that what you are building there if you are cutting 10 to 12 meters of the himalayas which uh, which means around 35 to 40 feet wide roads how these mountains will stay at their place so we have the idea of green roads we can make uh, you can you you may have seen mountain roads in different countries so all they have double lane roads even china the powerful china have built in tibet double lane only double lane making roads in the indo gangetic plain cannot be replicated in the himalaya or making roads in the tibet that cannot be replicated in the himalaya it is a fragile ecology we need roads but we needs green roads we need roads with less destruction so dams and way of making roads then mining there many other kind of encroachment into the into the nature into the forest has created uh, accelerated the pace of these these tragedies uh, earthquakes landslides and many other natural calamities forest fires they are very natural in himalayas in other mountain systems too but uh, we have to evolve the ways of controlling them so same is the case with dams and roads which are accelerating uh, the behavior destructive behavior uh, of 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 the rivers and this tragedy tells us only how we can develop how we can first evolve a project very scientifically covering observing examining all aspects its catchment its geology geography how far the project is from the main central thrust or main boundary thrust or other any uh, fault or uh, thrust of the himalaya uh, what kind of behavior has been for last 200 recorded history ecological history of the himalaya other uh, river behave after that we should uh, make smaller project in himalaya the large projects cannot be surveyed you see the case of the second project in uh, the tragedy area that is tapovan vishnu gali pariyojana they built around 12 km long tunnel and a 200 uh, crore price machine was working there it failed and then they started making tunnel from from joshimat towards uh, tapovan dhat tapovan it also failed and some other spring underground spring uh, bursts and there was some problem and now more than 200 people have lost their lives many people many experts say that they may be the number may be more than 300 because the workers have come the laborers have come from bihar from jharkhand from chatisgarh from up from nepal and they all belong to unorganized sector of indian labor class and we don't have a proper list and we are not able we are not able to make a proper list of the people who lost their lives in kedarna tragedy in 2030 most of the nepali are they are they are not uh, recorded anywhere so here it is also happened and till today more than 71 bodies have dug out from the tunnels 
and uh, about 15 uh, body parts have recovered of different bodies uh, from inside. And still uh, the forces, the, uh, this uh, national disaster uh, um, force is trying to uh, do some kind of work, but now there is no hope of getting any uh, person alive. And they don't have, or they also, they don't have any experience of working into the tunnels, you know, in the Himalaya. They are not trained for that, but they, they have done enough, but they are not trained for that. And they don't have any experience of uh, taking out uh, people from inside the tunnels. So this tragedy tells us, think more properly about the projects in the Himalaya, whether it is road construction, whether it is mining, uh, whether it is it is it is uh, it is uh, dam making. Even sometimes we say that ki, this is a barrage and we are developing run of the river systems. Even run of the river systems can be killers. Dams are in in Himachal. You can see every valley is under dams. When you make a dam, it means you are destroying the very important agricultural land in the Himalayas. And Himalaya area, only 3% of the total geographical area is under agriculture. In, our, in my own state, Uttarakhand, only 12% 12, 12 is under agriculture. In 82% mountainous Uttarakhand, only 6% agricultural land. And in the areas where this tragedy happened, only 3% of the total geographical area is under agriculture. So little agricultural land is there and that is you are taking there. And environmental refugees are made in thousands, in lakhs. In Tihri case, you can see more than one lakh people where uh, they became environmental refugees. So at this point, you know, 2013-2021, within seven years, we have another big tragedy. We have already big earthquake in our area in 91, then 99. We have earthquakes in Kashmir 2006. We have earthquake in, in Nepal a few years back. And in the context of Uttarakhand, especially uh, the Indo-Tibet border areas, the ge geologists and the scientists have been telling and telling that this is seismic gap area. Seismic gap area means an area in the Himalayas where for last many decades there is virtually no big earthquake. It means so much geoenergy is accumulating inside earth and one day it will release into the form of 8 hectare, 8 rector, 8 rector earthquake. Dr. Waldia, who is no more with us, have been warning and warning. Many other scientists are telling this. So in a seismic area where devastation, uh, earthquake uh, generated devastation is very natural, they are very much part of this uh, uh, geology and geography. We have uh, to develop our dams and roads and other activities in a very, very uh, humble way, very, very, uh, very uh, regional way so that they can sustain themselves. If we can sustain these structures and these developmental activities, then not only the people who are living in the Himalaya, but also the people who are coming from different parts of the world, their lives are safe. So for saving the human lives, we have to save Himalaya. And for that, we have to evolve more, just more human ways of development not this kind of development which we are experiencing in different parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mingma Tenzi Sherpa is a trusted expedition leader in the 8,000 meter climbing world. From the Makalu region of Nepal, Mingma has been climbing and leading expeditions for more than 15 years. He has climbed nine of the 14 8,000 meter peaks and has multiple summits of Everest, K2, Makalu and Amatabla among, among others. Most recently, Mingma was part of the 10 member Nepali team led by Nims Dai, 
that completed the historic first ascent of K2 in winter. In this interview, Mingma talks to Kuntal Joyshar about his journey so far and what he is planning for the spring, ascending the remaining 8,000 meter peaks. Kuntal Joyshar is an accomplished mountaineer and a computer science professional. He has climbed in India and across the world, has summited Everest twice as well as two other 8,000 meter peaks. Kuntal is also a photographer and a motivational speaker. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the annual seminar of the Himalayan Club and with me I have the amazing Mingma Tenji Sherpa. Uh, I have climbed with Mingma, uh, I've been climbing with Mingma since last six years. Uh, so I'm super happy to be hosting him uh, for Himalayan Club's annual seminar. Uh, to give you, uh, uh, to give everyone a background, uh, Mingma was recently the part of historic K2 winter ascent where he was part of uh, Nim, Team Nimsdai. Uh, they all stood on top of K2 in the winters and uh, we are here to uh, kind of get the entire story from Mingma himself. So uh, Mingma Dai, uh, uh, it, like, I remember that we have done so many expeditions in this time. और हम हमेशा K2 के बारे में बात करते हो तो आपने बोला कि आपने K2 पे इतने अटेम्प्ट्स किए हैं फाइनली आपका सक्सेस हुआ K2 पे आई थिंक 2018 में आई थिंक सक्सेसफुल हुआ आपका K2 तो आई थिंक फिफ्थ या फोर्थ या फिफ्थ अटेम्प्ट था जब भी आपका सक्सेसफुल हुआ K2 फाइनली और फिर आप बोलते थे अभी मैं K2 नहीं जाऊंगा और आउट ऑफ द ब्लू आप सीधा K2 पे विंटर में जाके समिट कर दिया तो ये ये सारा स्टोरी कैसे शुरू हुआ ये कैसे हो गया ये सब जी दाई अभी इसमें ये सब दोस्त की वजह से कनेक्ट हो गया था कांटेक्ट की वजह से तो पहले हम लोग उस तरह मैं जाना भी नहीं चाहता था लेकिन लास्ट आवर में सब लोग बोला कि हम सब लोग एक्सपीरियंस है तो हम सब नेपाली टीम है तो हम साथ में जाएंगे हम सिर्फ शूटिंग करेंगे जितना हुआ हम अच्छा बेस्ट करेंगे तो इसलिए मैंने भी एक्सेप्ट कर लिया कि ठीक है तो सब लोग बराबर है तो हम जाएंगे नहीं तो पे इसके पहले तो मैं थोड़ा कंफ्यूजन में था उतना जाने का इंटरेस्ट भी नहीं था दाई तो लास्ट आवर में मैंने ज्वाइन कर दिया टीम में तो जाते जाते अच्छा भी तो तो आप हम आप हमें थोड़ा एक्सपेडिशन के बारे में बताओ कि मतलब K2 ऑलरेडी समर्स में इतना हार्ड है लाइक इतने लाइक हार्डली एक सीजन में 20 30 लोग सबमिट करते कभी-कभी तो ऐसे ऐसे सीजन जाते कभी कोई सबमिट ही नहीं करता है K2 में तो विंटर में क्या डिफरेंस था लाइक क्या डिफरेंस महसूस आपने तो दोनों समर में भी किया है अभी विंटर में भी किया है तो क्या मतलब डिफरेंस क्या है थोड़ा एक्सपीरियंस के बारे में बताओ कि कैसा था आपका जर्नी जी दाई सबको पता है कि माउंट के2 कैसा है ओल में तो मैंने सात बार ट्राई किया था ये क्लाइंबिंग मेरा सातों बार है तो सातों बार में मैंने वही 2018 में फर्स्ट समिट किया 2009 में नहीं हो गया 15 14 में नहीं हो गया 16 में भी नहीं हो गया तो 17 में नहीं गया तो 19 में भी नहीं हो गया फिर तो 18 में एडिस समिट किया इसके बाद फिर सोचा कि अभी इतना ही है अभी हम नहीं करेंगे तो फिर ये साल विंटर में गया तो टोटली डिफरेंट है दाई जैसा जितना ठंडा जैसा नेपाल हिमालयन हिमालयन में है उसने से भी ज्यादा लगा मेरे ख्याल से उतना ज्यादा ठंडा है क्योंकि उधर सारों उपान है ना दाई इधर तो ज्यादा जंगल ज्यादा है तो इधर थोड़ा वो टेम्परेचर थोड़ा कम जैसा लगता है क्योंकि पता नहीं क्यों इस तरह लगा मेरे को लेकिन उधर समर से अभी समर विंटर का कंपेयर करने तो दस गुना अलग है दाई इतना डिफरेंट है तो सिर्फ इतना ये ये आसन था कि सिर्फ वो क्लाइमिंग पीरियड में सॉप स्नो नहीं था तो वो हार्ड स्नो था तो थोड़ा उसमें टेक्निकली पार्ट में टेक्निकल ज्यादा था समर से भी ज्यादा लेकिन डीप स्नो नहीं था तो क्लाइमिंग करने में थोड़ा आसन हो गया जैसे फील हो गया मेरे को लेकिन जैसा पहले फिर डेंजर भी उस तरह ही ज्यादा है टेक्निकली भी में थोड़ा टेक्निकली भी है लेकिन वो स्नो कंडीशन थोड़ा अच्छा हुआ तो फिर वो डेंजर कम होता है ना जो रॉकफॉल कम होता था पहले जो शामर में अभी विंटर में क्या है 
सारो कैम्प थ्री के नीचे बेस कैम्प से ऊपर सारो वो तीनों कैम्प तक सारो मिक्स क्लाइमिंग है दाई आइस एंड रॉक आफ्टर दैट फिर वो स्नो हॉट स्नो है उसके बाद अच्छा है फिर वो बीच में कैम्प थ्री से कैम्प फोर के बीच में इसके बाद फिर वो बदलने के लाइन में समिट के नीचे तक पूरा ब्लू आइस था पहले उस तरह नहीं था था अभी टोटली डिफरेंट है टोटली डिफरेंट है मुझे याद है कि आपने मुझे आपके 2019 के के टू के वीडियोस भेजे थे और मुझे अभी भी याद है कि बॉटल नेक के नीचे आपके हाइट का स्नो था इधर इधर तक स्नो था आप एवरी स्टेप में आप पूरा अपने हाइट में घुस जा रहे थे स्नो में और आप मुझे मालूम है आपका आइस एक्स लेके सारा स्नो निकाल रहे हो तो क्या सिचुएशन क्या था बॉटल नेक के नीचे दाई वो टाइम में बहुत सॉफ्ट स्नो था वो कुलोर कुलोर था ना दाई वो कुलोर में बहुत सॉफ्ट स्नो था मैंने इतना नहीं दाई मेरे सर से इतना ऊपर था इतना ऊपर था क्योंकि नीचे अंदर पूरा ब्लू स्नो था ना दाई ब्लू आइस ब्लू ब्लू आइस इसके ऊपर सॉप स्नो तो भी वो तो भी दो लेयर था अलग अलग लेयर था तो इसके वजह से कुछ एक दिन पहले जो अंग्रेज लोग एक गया था उसने उसका फिर थोड़ा फॉल भी हो गया एक दो सौ मीटर फॉल भी हो गया तो वो पास आ गया इसके बाद फिर हमने रास्ता 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 बनाने की कोशिश किया तो उधर का कंडीशन देख के क्योंकि वो वो दिन में जो हम सब में जा, जाने की टाइम हमने जो स्केड्यूल बनाया था वो दिन में तकरीबन चार पैंतालीस पचास बंदे था समिट पुश के लिए वाव तो मैंने सोचा कि अभी ज्यादा पुश किया तो हम कर सकते थे लेकिन क्या है डेंजर उधर से ऊपर से थोड़ा ट्रॉबस लेना था तो ट्रॉबस में मैं बहुत कंफ्यूजन हो गया था इधर कुछ मिस्टेक हो गया था मैं भी जाऊंगा <laughs> तो जितना अभी मैं मैं ऊपर निकल जाऊंगा लेकिन बाद में तो बहुत बंदे आ, आना आना है ना समेत में तो तो सबकी लाइफ ब्रिक्स में है समझ के मैंने वो वो टाइम में मैंने गिप अप कर लिया तो सारों ग्रुप ने भी गिप अप किया लेकिन बाद में फिर चार पांच दिन के बाद बहुत मौसम खराब हो गया था ना दाई विन चकदा था फिर विन की वजह से मेरे से एयरलाइन से सब सब तो निकल गया हाँ इस तो निकल गया इसके बाद फिर अच्छा से हमारे न्यूज दाई लोग ने फिर सबमिट कर दिया बाद में वो अच्छा बात था लेकिन हमारा हमरा नहीं हो गया वो दुख की बात था <laughs> नहीं पर नहीं बट कैसा है कि आई थिंक सेफ्टी भी बहुत जरूरी है लोग क्या करते हैं कि सेफ्टी को कॉम्प्रोमाइज करते हैं कि तो सेफ्टी को कॉम्प्रोमाइज नहीं करना चाहिए क्योंकि माउंटेन्स तो वही रहने वाले हैं हमें भी जिंदा रहना जरूरी है तो आपके स्मार्टनेस की वजह से कितने और सारे लोगों का जान बच गया है अगर कोई कुछ प्रॉब्लम हो जाता तो फिर यू नो बहुत प्रॉब्लम हो जाता है इसलिए वजह से हम मैंने सबो सारों को बोल दिया कि अभी ऊपर नहीं जा सकते मैंने सारों सा, मैंने वीडियो जो शेयर किया था वो भी सबको देखा दिया तो ये देखो पहले इसके बाद आप भी शेयर कर दो तो सब लोग ने बोला कि ये सही है हम वापस जाएंगे तो हम वो टाइम में हम वापस आ गए टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन में था तो फिर ये टाइम टू थाउजेंड में जनवरी में इस टाइम में कैसा था बॉटल नेक के नीचे आपने बोला कि ब्लू आइस था बट अदरवाइज लाइक कैसा था लाइक like, क्योंकि हम लोग सब यहाँ इंस्टाग्राम पे बैठ के देख रहे थे एक यू नो आई थिंक निम्स दाई ने या किसी ने तो ये एक स्टोरी डाल दिया था कि नाउ वी आर अंडर बॉटल नेक वी आर सून क्रॉसिंग बॉटल नेक अभी आप लोग तो वो बोल रहे हो वहां से बट हमें तो यहाँ समझ में नहीं आ रहा अरे क्या होगा क्या होगा क्या हो रहा है कैसा है वहाँ स्नो कैसा है क्या हो रहा है हमें कुछ पता नहीं था तो आप हमें अगर कुछ थोड़ा डिटेल दे सको तो हाँ दाई वो इस तरह था जैसा समर में तो सब सौ, स्नो ज्यादा था ना दाई वो ब्लू आइस भी सिर्फ अंदर देखता था तो बाहर उतना नहीं देखता था अभी क्या है सर ब्लू आइस टोटली ब्लू आइस है दाई टॉबस में क्लाइमिंग में सब जगह में अराउंड छ सात सौ मीटर तक ब्लू आइस था तो काफी तो, मतलब टेक्निकल हो गया क्योंकि ब्लू आइस में तो बहुत ही क्लाइमिंग रिस्की हो जाता है हाँ ना दाई हाँ ना था लेकिन सब लोग तकरा था सब लोग एक्सपीरियंस भी था सब लोग का फिजिकल अच्छा बराबर था तो मौसम भी अच्छा था सिर्फ दिन में अच्छा था रात में बहुत ठंडा था फिर सुबह दो जो धूप निकल गया ना दही शाम को तो फिर शुरू हो गया कि बहुत टेम्परेचर लो था तो इस तरह करके हमेशा में किया था 
तो मिंगमा ठंडी के बारे में मैंने बहुत लाइक आपने मुझे आपने भी हमने भी जब थोड़ी दिन पहले बात किया था तो आपने ठंडी के बारे में बहुत बताया था कि बहुत ज्यादा ठंडी था तो मतलब आप डिस्क्राइब कर सकते हो मतलब लाइक कंपेरिजन कर सकते हो कि समझो अगर एवरेस्ट के एवरेस्ट के समिट में जितना ठंडी होता है और के टू के समझो कैंप फोर में मतलब वो कैसे कंपेरेबल ठंडी है मतलब क्या कैसे होता है भाई वो तो हम बेस्ट कैम ही कंपेयर कर सकते हैं जैसा जितना हम हम कैम्प थ्री में जो ठंडा होता है ना भाई समर में स्प्रिंग में हाँ। वो ठंडा बेस्ट कैम में था बाप रे हाँ। तो समझ लो ऊपर के कितना होगा भाई बेस्ट कैम में तो हम बार एक बार थोड़ी देर निकलते है ठंडा होता है फिर अंदर टेन में जाके फिर हीटर हीटर लगा के बैठता है ना तो उधर उतना पता नहीं चलता है लेकिन वो जे जो ठंडा का रेंज है ना भाई वही था जैसे कैम्प थ्री में कैम्प फोर में जितना ठंडा होता है वो बेस्ट कैम होता था बाप रे विंटर में तो फिर मतलब बहुत ही ज्यादा ठंडी था तो कैसे मतलब कैसे मैनेज के, कैसे मैनेज किया ये क्वेश्चन तो ये जैसा हम मैंने लाइफ में कभी यूज नहीं किया ये हैंड वॉमर तो एक ये थर्मिक नाम का एक हैंड वॉमर दिया था निम्स दाई ने उसका पास बहुत था तो हम सब लोग ने वो हैंड वॉमर पे सपोर्ट हैंड वॉमर पे बहुत सपोर्ट मिला ना दाई राइट हाथ जो उंगलिया अच्छा बराबर रखने के लिए होम अप करने के लिए तो बहुत आसान हो गया था इसके वजह से नहीं भी रात को बहुत जैसा समझ लो दाई हम रात को कैम्प थ्री से दो बजे एक बजे निकलने का प्लानिंग बनाया था शाम सो, सोते वक्त लेकिन ठंड की वजह से कल सुबह थोड़ा लेट हो गया हम उधर से मेरे ख्याल से दो बजे निकला होगा कैम्प टू से कैम्प थ्री से समिट के लिए तो भी रात को इसके वजह से ज्यादा वो वही कुछ भाई लोग का वो हो गया हाँ हो गया तो किसी का फर्स्ट निप हो गया फर्स्ट बाइट तो नहीं हो गया फर्स्ट निप सब जैसा हो गया सिर्फ मिंगवा डेबी का नहीं हो गया है दो दो तीन अभी हम सिर्फ तीन तीन बंदे को कुछ नहीं हो गया हम डेबी का भी थोड़ा स्किन तो थोड़ा थोड़ा गया है लेकिन उतना ज्यादा नहीं सिर्फ व्हाइट वाला सुपर <laughs> सुपर तो, तो फिर ए, अभी मुझे ना थोड़ा डिटेल आपको समिट का डिटेल जानना है तो आपने ट्रावर्स कर लिया बॉटल ने क्रॉस किया ट्रावर्स भी किया उसके बाद प्रॉपर रिच क्लाइंबिंग है एटलीस्ट जितना मुझे पता है केटू के बारे में मुझे तो भी ज्यादा पता नहीं है बट रिच क्लाइंबिंग है जो के टॉप तक जाता है फिर तो जी भाई एंड में आप लोग सब लोग रुक गए क्योंकि वहां मुझे पता है कि वो दावा शेरपा जो सेवन समिट का है उसने एक फोटो शेयर किया था कि रिज के ऊपर सब शेरपा आई थिंक रुके हुए हैं और बाकी टीम मेंबर्स के लिए वेट कर रहे हैं बाकी सब टीम मेंबर्स आएंगे और सब साथ में जाने वाले थे तो वो मतलब वो उसके बारे में आप डिस्क्राइब थोड़ा डिटेल दे सकते हो हमको हाँ जी दाई जैसा हम क्लाइंबिंग में सब बोतल ने की नीचे तक सब साथ में था फिर वहां से तो कोई फिक्सिंग टिप आगे कोई पीछे करते करते गया तो फिर ऊपर एक सोल्जर है दाई तो बोतल ने के नीचे मेरे ख्याल से एक एक सौ मीटर जैसा ट्रॉबस था उसके नीचे क्लोर में पूरा रॉक मिक्स क्लाइंबिंग रॉक एंड आइस इसके बाद दो एक डेढ़ एक सौ डेढ़ सौ मीटर तक ट्रॉबस ब्लू आइस इसके बाद सीधा फिर चार सौ पांच सौ मीटर तक स्ट्रेट ब्लू आइस इसके बाद शोल्डर शोल्डर के बाद फिर हॉट स्नो है था तकरी तकरीबन दो सौ तीन सौ मीटर तक तो एक फिर एक रिच आता है समेट का तो सोमर में उधर अच्छा होता था लेकिन ये साल के था उधर समेट के थोड़ा नीचे बहुत बड़ा वाला खरबस निकल गया था पता नहीं नेक्स्ट ईयर सोमर में भी उस तरह ही होता है या सिर्फ विंटर में इस तरह होता है मैंने मेरे को वही डे नहीं है लेकिन वो सोमर में नहीं था तो ये साल वो इस तरह खरबस था तो वो तो खरबस के नीचे सिर्फ समझ लो सात सत्री मीटर नीचे सेवेंटी सेवेंटी मीटर नीचे वो हमारा रेसिपी खत्म हो गया था जितना हमने उठाया था तो हम सारा उधर वो किया फिर इसके बाद फिर जो पीछे से रोप लेकर आता था जो भाई लोग ने पैंतीस पैंतीस मीटर का दो दो रेसिया तो ऊपर लेकर आ गया फिर फिक्स किया सत्तर मीटर इसके बाद हम सब लोग रोक गया उधर दस दस पंद्रह मीटर के नीचे सब रोक के 
सब लोग सब लोग को वेट किया इसके बाद फिर इसके बाद थोड़ा आगे गया इसके बाद फिर वो किया इसके बाद हाथ हाथ पकड़ के फिर साथ में समिट समिट में समिट तक गया हूँ भाई और पूरा और तभी नेपाल का नेशनल एंथम भी गाते सब साथ में सब हाँ, गए हाँ हाँ जी भाई बहुत अच्छा लगा था तो वो जो आपने आपने सॉरी ट्रू इंटर बट आपने जो क्रेवास के बारे में बोला तो वो क्रेवास आपको क्रॉस करना पड़ा या मतलब क्या वो क्रेवास का कैसा था हाँ वही वही क्रॉस करके ना दाई जम मार के अच्छा जम मार के मतलब छोटा क्रेवास था अच्छा उतना वाइड नहीं था हम हाँ हम जम कर सकता था भाई अच्छा ओके ओके बाओ उतने 8500 मीटर पे सब क्रेवास जंपिंग कर रहे थे 8600 मीटर पे सब क्रेवास जंपिंग कर रहे थे हाँ ना भाई नहीं करना है ना फिर वो नहीं कर पाया तो फिर समिट नहीं होता है ना नहीं होता है। <laughs> तो तो, 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 तो आपने जब भी टॉप देखा तो मतलब आप ए, आपने इतने सारे माउंटेन क्लाइम कर लिए लाइफ में इतना सब कुछ यू नो सबमिट किया है तो जस्ट अनदर माउंटेन था या माइंड में कुछ अलग फीलिंग भी आ रहा था लाइक like, जैसे मेरे लिए तो जब मैंने एवरेस्ट फर्स्ट टाइम क्लाइम किया तो मेरे लिए तो लाइक like, जैसे मैंने जिंदगी का सबसे बड़ा चीज कर लिया पर आपने तो इतने सारे 8000 मीटर माउंटेन कर लिए अभी यू नो मैं तो हर साल एवरेस्ट चढ़ता हूँ मैं तो हर साल किटू चढ़ता हूँ तो यू नो मेरे लिए तो ये रो, रोज का काम है तो कुछ ये कुछ नया फीलिंग था माइंड में कुछ ऐसा नया फील हुआ नहीं बिल्कुल नहीं जैसा पहले जो मन में जैसा खुश होता है ना भाई पहला जैसा फर्स्ट टाइम में मैंने बच्चे समिट किया था तो समझ रहे कि वाह अभी सबसे ऊपर में हूँ अब सबसे अच्छा काम तो मैंने किया हूँ अभी मैं पहुंच गया इस तरह सा फीलिंग हो गया था इसके बाद के बाकी एट थाउजेंड में उतना उतना इस तरह का फीलिंग नहीं आ गया था क्योंकि सिर्फ एक दो बार होता है ना भाई इस तरह फील हो गया तो के टू में भी उस तरह एक्साइटेड नहीं था पहले जैसा एटीन में भी था लेकिन ये साल क्या था ये साल सब लोग जो नेशनल एंथम लगा के जो सॉन्ग लगा के क्लाइंबिंग किया एक साथ में उसका एक्सपीरियंस एक्सप्रेशन ना अलग था था अलग तो दिल में दिल में छुता है ना दाई कभी कभी क्या है यार ये मैंने भी लाइफ में पहले कुछ नहीं मतलब अच्छा अभी आपका नाम हिस्ट्री में आ गया मौका मिला जैसा फील हो गया हाँ, अच्छा। आपका नाम पूरे हिस्ट्री में आ गया माउंटेनियरिंग के अभी हाँ, जब भी कोई के टू विंटर के बारे में बात करेगा के टू विंटर फर्स्ट समेट टेन नेपाली पीपल क्लाइम तो आपका नाम हमेशा भी उसमें आएगा जो क्लाइंबिंग से क्लाइंबिंग करने से पहले तो हम उस तरह एक्सपेक्ट नहीं किया था याद हम इस तरह न्यूज में आएगा हम ये काम कर रहा हूँ ये कर ये हो रहा ये होगा लेकिन जब हम समेट करके नीचे आया तो कुछ अलग था दाई तो <laughs> तो जब है ना दाई हम क्लाइंबिंग पीरियड में जब कैंप हो पहुंचा ना कैंप होता अभी तक हिस्ट्री में कोई नहीं पहुंचा कोई नहीं पहुंचा हाँ तो, तो आप तीन आप तीन या तो चार लोग थे ना आप थे मिंगमा डेविड था मिंगमा जी मिंगमा जी था और सोना सोना एंड मी चार बंदे था ना तो हम हम चार होने बोला की हमने ब्रेकअप कर लिया अभी पहले के हिस्टोरी हमने हमने हम सबसे ऊपर है इस सबसे ऊपर उधर उधर एक उधर भी एक खुशी मिला था ना दाई राइट 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 सबसे पहले सबसे पहले पीपल इन द वर्ल्ड टू गेट टू के टू इतना हाई इन विंटर हाई में कैंप हो में वाह तो हम उधर भी बहुत खुश था फिर सेकेंड में कल फिर दोबारा दिन फिर जब हम सबमिट हो गया तो हम बहुत खुश था सब लोग ये था कि सबको किसी को कुछ भी प्रॉब्लम नहीं हो गया था थोड़ा थोड़ा फर्स्ट फर्स्ट फर्स निकल गया था लेकिन उसका डैम किया कोई भी उसका मैंने को ये तो ये दर्द हो रहा है ये दर्द कोई भी नहीं मानता था कि वो बेस्ट में पहुंचने के बाद सब डांस शुरू हो सब डांस कोई भी नहीं सोया कोई भी नहीं सोया तो मिंगमा ने थोड़ा निम्स दाई के बारे में भी हम हम सबको बताओ कि आपका ये फर्स्ट एक्सपीडिशन था निम्स दाई के साथ तो निम्स दाई के साथ कैसा एक्सपीरियंस था निम्स दाई का लीडरशिप के बारे में अगर हम आप आप हमें थोड़ा बता सके तो क्योंकि आई एम प्रीटी श्योर लॉर्ड ऑफ व्यूअर्स को जानना है कि क्योंकि यू नो निम्स दाई के बारे में लॉर्ड ऑफ यू नो जो भी हमें मिलता है वो सब उनके इंस्टाग्राम के स्टोरीज और उनके इंस्टाग्राम के पोस्ट के थ्रू मिलता है आप तो उनके साथ इतने दिन थे उनके साथ क्लाइंबिंग किया और उनके लीडरशिप के अंदर क्लाइंबिंग किया तो मतलब आप अगर हमें थोड़ा डिटेल दे सको निम्स दाई के बारे में जी दाई ये मेरा फर्स्ट एक्सपीडिशन है के साथ 
तो पहले भी हम एक एक मिला था कभी कभी एक दो बार मिला है के टू बेस्ट में भी मिला था 2018-19 में भी एवरेस्ट में भी मिला था लेकिन उतना हम क्लोज नहीं था तो ये साल साथ में काम करने का भी मिला साथ में क्लाइंबिंग भी किया तो निर्ज दाई सबसे अलग है दाई क्योंकि वो उसका जो डिसीजन है ना आज आ, आ, आज एक बोलना है तो क, बोलने से पहले कल क्या हो, होगा कल क्या हो रहा है वो ये समझता है उसका डिसीजन अच्छा है दाई निम्स दाई हाँ वो उसका अलग है दाई जैसा वो उसने बोला है कि पहले से ही मैं उधर ऑक्सीजन करूंगा उधर ऑक्सीजन करूंगा हम फिर बोल रहे थे कि नहीं दाई यार अभी विंटर में समर में तो ठीक था स्प्रिंग में ठीक था ये विंटर में ऐसे भी ठंड है क्यों करने का क्यों करने का नहीं तो पर उन्होंने किया और उन्होंने करके सबको दिखा हाँ। भी दिया कि वो कर सकते हैं हाँ तो अलग हुमेन भी नहीं है दाई निम्स दाई मैं सोचता हूँ की कैसे करता है <laughs> तो नहीं अभी क्लाइंबिंग तो हम सर वो फिर जो भी करता है वो बोझ उठाता भी है वो फिक्सिंग लाइन करना है तो फिक्सिंग लाइन भी करता है फिर क्योंकि वो पहले से स्पेशल फोर्स से भी है ना वो सब कुछ बोक के आया है करके आया ना तो उसका सब पता है कि लाइफ क्या है थोड़ा स्ट्रगल हम समझते हैं ना थोड़ा पेट में दर्द हो गया तो दाई तो थोड़ा थोड़ा दर्द कभी नहीं होने का ना दाई किसी को पहले से कभी दर्द नहीं हुआ तो फिर थोड़ा थोड़ा दर्द होने के बाद समझते है कि वाह मेरे को क्या हो गया मैं मरूंगा इस तरह समझते है ना तो नीम सही का थोड़ा 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 पेट का दरात कुछ दरात के लिए कुछ भी नहीं फर्क पड़ता है वो इस तरह का वाव 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 सुपर सुपर तो जी दाई, आ, अच्छा है दाई। और जी तो मिंगमा दाई आप जब भी सो के टू क्लाइम कर लिया नीचे आके पाकिस्तान में आ, ये बेस कैम्प में आके भी पार्टी कर लिया फिर आप स्कारदू गए फिर पाकिस्तान में आप बहुत टाइम थे आप आप सबसे मिले आई थिंक वहाँ के पूरे लाइक कम्युनिटी से मिले आर्मी से मिले सबसे मिले आपका बहुत अच्छे से वेलकम हुआ फिर नेपाल आए नेपाल में तो मुझे पता है एयरपोर्ट पे आप लोगों को इतने लोग लेने आए थे और करीबन दस दिन तक तो आपका सिर्फ सेलिब्रेशन प्रोग्राम ही चल रहा था आपका फेलिसिटेशन प्रोग्राम चल रहा था तो मतलब कैसा लग रहा है ये कैसा फीलिंग आ रहा है लास्ट इतने बीस दिन से मतलब वापस आने के बाद कैसा कैसा फीलिंग हो रहा है भाई जैसा जितना जब बेस्कैम से नीचे आते आने के बाद जितना हमको रेस्पेक्ट मिला है दाई जैसा समझ लो पाकिस्तान में भी बहुत सब लोग ने जो टूरिज्म सेक्टर में जो टूरिज्म सेक्टर में काम करता है उसके प्रोपोजल में जाता है ना तो उसका सबको अच्छा से रेस्पेक्ट मिला है मिलता है तो इसके बाद जब नेपाल में आ गया दाई तो सब लोग ने वेलकम किया तो हम समझते कि हमने भी हमारा हमारा कंट्री के लिए कुछ किया है yeah. तो इस तरह बहुत खुश हो गया था ये सब लोग ने अच्छा से बिहेव किया तो सिर्फ हम तो इतना जितना था अभी तक किया था उसका कुछ नहीं था ना दाई कोई भी नहीं पहचान था कि हमने क्या किया है अभी तक तो yeah. हम समझते हैं कि हम दिल से हम दिल से बोलते हैं दिल से समझते हैं कि हमने भी कंट्री के लिए कुछ डिस्ट्रीब्यूट किया है अभी yeah. हम इस पहले से समझता ये साल लेकिन सब लोग ने अच्छा से किया अच्छा से बिहेव किया दाई तो सब लोग को पता चला कि ये माउंटेन की वजह से हमारे कंट्री लिए भी एक पहचान मिला इस तरह सब लोग ने समझ गया दाई तो यही हमारे लिए अच्छा है जी दाई और वापस अभी फाइनली अभी आप अपने गांव जाने वाले हो और अभी आप अपने बेटे बेटी को भी मिलने वाले हो तो आपकी बेटी ऑलरेडी है अभी यही है हाँ। तो... फाइनली अभी पहले सारे सब लोगों को मिल लिया अभी फाइनली एट द एंड तो आके फैमिली के साथ ही सेलिब्रेट करना है जी दाई। अभी दाई, अभी हाँ, अभी एक महीने टाइम है दाई एक महीने तक गांव में थोड़ा थोड़ा काम भी करना है दाई ये कुछ गवर्नमेंट का थोड़ा काम है दाई वो खत्म करने के बाद वो दो तीन हफ्ते में वो क्लियर करूंगा इसके बाद थोड़ा फिर टाइम फैमिली का भी टाइम दे दूंगा इसके बाद फिर काठमांडू आऊंगा दाई फिर वापस एवरेस्ट फिर वापस वही सीजन स्टार्ट और सब कुछ स्टार्ट हाँ जी दाई मैं प्लानिंग कर रहा हूँ कि फोर्टीन पिक क्लियर करूँ तो 
देखते हैं दाई अभी मेरा नौ तो हो गया अभी पांच तो बाकी है ना दाई तो पांच को क्लियर करने का दिल कर रहे हैं तो फिर दोस्त लोग भी बोल रहे हैं कि अभी इतना ही बाकी है तो आप क्यों रोक रहे हो करो करो तो निमता ने भी बोला है कि अन्नपूर्णा वन जाओ निमता भी जाने का प्लानिंग बना रहा है लेकिन अभी फिक्स तो नहीं है होगा तो हम दोनों अन्नपूर्णा वन जाएंगे दाई इसके बाद फिर देखे दाई एवरेस्ट तो जाऊ एवरेस्ट जाऊंगा फिर टाइम मिला तो पंचजंगा का पेपर लाने आता है पंचजंगा भी कुछ लेकिन ये साल थोड़ा छोटा टीम है कंचजंगा में सुना है तो okay. देखते हैं दाई अच्छा टीम बराबर है तो फिर उतार भी जाने का कोशिश करेंगे दाई देखते सुपर सुपर दाई फिर फा, फाइनली मिंग दाई एक मैसेज जो आपको देना है लाइक काफी आ, अभी काफी लोगों को माउंटेनियरिंग में बहुत इंटरेस्ट जाग रहा है क्लाइंबिंग में बहुत इंटरेस्ट जाग रहा है काफी नए नए लोग आ रहे हैं जो लोग ट्राई कर रहे हैं माउंटेन्स क्लाइंब करने का तो कोई एक मैसेज उनको और ये सारा एनुअल सेमिनार के ऑडियंस के लिए कोई मैसेज आपकी तरफ से जी भाई मैं तो हर टाइम कहता हूँ की जैसा जितना क्लाइंब में तो एक गाइडिंग और ये हम तो वर्कर्स की वर्कर्स काम करते है ना तो हम सबको बोलते है की हम गाइडिंग करने में भी थोड़ा अच्छा से करना के लिए सो जो जो एक्सपीरियंस क्लाइंट्स आता है ना जैसा जो माउंटेन में क्लाइंबिंग करने के लिए आएगा तो कुछ एक्सपीरियंस खुद के लिए जैसा एट थाउजेंड करने से पहले कुछ सेवन थाउजेंड कर लो सेवन थाउजेंड करने से पहले कुछ सिक्स थाउजेंड का एक्सपीरियंस ले लो स्टेप बाई स्टेप किया तो खुद के लिए भी एक्सपीरियंस अच्छा होगा खुद के लिए तो फिर दूसरे के लिए जैसा गाइड के लिए भी अच्छा होगा तो सब लोग स्टेप बाय स्टेप जो जो भी जहां पर कुछ कहीं भी माउंटेन में क्लाइंबिंग किया करना है तो कुछ माउंटेन में क्लाइंबिंग करना है तो माउंटेन का ही कुछ ट्रेनिंग करना है ना दाई माउंटेन के लिए कुछ सीखना है तो सबको सेफ रहेगा तो मैं तो यही बोलना चाहता हूँ दाई की सब लोग सिर्फ हम समझते है कि हम माउंटेन पैसे पैसे के पैसे देने के बाद सब लोग सब कुछ हो जाएगा लेकिन सब ये नहीं है कि हम पैसे की वजह से एवरेस्ट में कुछ कोई भी उठा के नहीं लेकर जा सकते कुछ चलना है राइट right, कुछ तो, चलना है तो ट्रेनिंग करो एक्सपीरियंस हाँ बनाओ अच्छे से फिजिकल फिटनेस पे काम करो और स्टडी स्टेप बाय स्टेप क्लाइंबिंग छह हजार मीटर सात हजार मीटर फिर आठ हजार मीटर फिर एवरेस्ट मीटर एवरेस्ट आई थिंक गुड आई थिंक वेरी वेरी गुड एडवाइस ये बहुत लोगों को सुनने की बहुत जरूरत है क्योंकि आजकल कैसा हो रहा है किसी का वीडियो देखा अरे इन्होंने तो वाह क्या अमेजिंग वीडियो है क्या अमेजिंग फोटोज है चलो जाके हम भी केटू क्लाइम करेंगे चलो जाके हम भी एवरेज क्लाइम करेंगे वैसे नहीं स्टेप बाय स्टेप ट्रेनिंग करो एक्सपीरियंस करो फिर आराम से आओ हाँ ना दाई इस तरह किया तो अच्छा रहेगा दाई सब सब लोग के लिए है ना दाई हम खुद के लिए भी बहुत खुद का खुद का डिसाइड कर सकते कि मैं क्या कर रहा हूँ ये ये किया था अच्छा होगा सब सुपर जी दाई थैंक यू सो मच मिंगा दाई जी दाई थैंक यू फ्रॉम हिमालयन क्लब टीम के आपने एक्सेप्ट किया इनविटेशन और अपने थोड़ी स्टोरी शेयर की केटू के जर्नी की होप टू हियर मोर एंड मोर फ्रॉम योर साइड अगर अगर की अगर Uh, आपका पास इंस्टाग्राम पेज है जिसका नाम एम टी डॉट शेरपा है तो अगर किसी को भी मिंगमा दाई के जर्नीज को फॉलो करना है तो प्लीज उनके इंस्टाग्राम पेज को फॉलो करो वहां आपको सारे उनके स्टोरी सारे पिक्चर्स सब कुछ के डिटेल्स इजीली मिल जाएंगे थैंक यू सो मच मिंगमा दाई थैंक यू Between March 27th and April 1st, the Himalayan Club is organizing a photography workshop facilitated by Jatin Lodaya. This six-day workshop will be held in Lansdowne, Uttarakhand. You can find more information on the Himalayan Club website. If you are interested in signing up for the workshop, please get in touch with the Himalayan Club. I assure you, it will be a great experience. The Keku Naroji Book Award ceremony is usually a part of the annual seminar. However, this year, because of the circumstances brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, publishers could not deliver books on time. The upside is that the shortlist has 12 amazing books, the highest number ever. This is making it pretty hard for the jury to select a winner. They will let us know the winner by the end of March. 
So follow the Himalayan Club on Facebook and Instagram or join their mailing list for news on the Keku Naroji Book Award and presentation ceremony. Two of the books shortlisted for the award, Winter 8000 and To Live Fighting for Life on the Killer Mountain, are being presented in the annual seminar this year. The much-awaited Bath Mountain Film Festival will be streamed online shortly. We will share more details on our Facebook page and on Instagram, so do keep a lookout. Coming up in April is part two of our writing workshop. The first one was conducted by Stephen Alter in December 2020. The next guest conductor will be Bernadette McDonald. We will announce the dates shortly, but if you are interested in the workshop, do read Bernadette's book, Winter 8000, easily available on Amazon. This is part of the assigned reading to enroll for the workshop. I hope you've enjoyed this year's annual seminar. Hosting an online seminar like this is a first for us as well, and it took a lot of coordination and cooperation. There is one aspect that we have not been able to replicate, which is the Q&A that usually follows every talk and sparks a lot of interesting discussions. Unfortunately, it was very difficult to manage the multiple time zones and speakers. But we do encourage you to initiate discussions on social media. We will also try to forward some of your questions to the speakers. I'd like to begin by thanking all of our incredible speakers for their support and willingness to share their stories and presentations online. Thank you for taking the time to record and adapting to this new normal. A special thank you to the Alpine Club and their club cast team for making some of the talks possible. A big thank you to the Himalayan Club volunteers and technical team. Despite being online, the seminar took a lot of coordination and the learning of some new skills and technical expertise. Our volunteers have been working very hard to make this online seminar a reality. And finally, thank you to all of you, our audience. Thank you for supporting us and making the time to engage with us even if remotely. We hope to see you again next year, inshallah in person.